very important to make a distinction between good progress and bad progress. Things progress in the sense that they change, but when they reach a certain scale, they turn out to be dead ends. We're now reaching a point at which technological progress threatens the very existence of humanity. Massive inequity of climate change, the loss of biodiversity, have been driven over the last 200 years by a system of overproduction of stuff. Nature is not this endless credit card that we can just keep drawing on. We have to use less. An expanding world horizon. How can we live within the real limits that our planet gives us? Um, the challenge to us, and I think having sat in Parliament for the last year, which is a deeply delusional place in which it is accepted as the only thing one can say is that we must have economic growth. We must have growth in the oil sands. We must export the bitumen as fast as humanly possible. We must have more economic investment. It has to be, we must get rid of these environmental laws that stand in our way. And by the way, looking at that young woman, looking, or little girl really, looking at all those different bottles of nail polish and trying to decide, I just wrote a piece recently on the effect of Bill C-38 on consumer protections in Canada. And I haven't talked about this much, but by the way, there's lots in C38 that undermines consumer protections, um, you know, basically getting rid of regulations before the Minister of Health can approve new food products and new retail products and new drugs, by the way. Pharmaceuticals will get easier to introduce. And it was greeted with great jubilation by the food and manufacturer retailers who said, Canada has been suffering from overregulation, which has deprived consumer the consumers of Canada of marketplace choice. I thought, haven't they been to the marketplace lately? I mean, there's a dizzying array of everything. So my question to Ron, and I'll start conversation, and then anybody who wants to ask a question, I'm not quite sure what people want to do about microphones and if we need them, but somebody who's doing the technical stuff will tell me, because we want to have your questions too. My question is, how do we break through free of being in a society where the overwhelming presumption is that we have to talk as though we're crazy people and ignore the reality around us lest we be seen as less than serious? You see the problem. And we're the only political party that's going to say this stuff out loud. I'm pretty sure of that. I wish there were more of them, but I think we're the only political party that's going to say out loud that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, as Herman Daly economists the World Bank said. We're the only ones who are going to say, we are running the risk of the ultimate proof that every time history repeats itself, the price goes up. How do we get ourselves to where we can wake people up enough to say it without having people think, well, those people must be crazy because we don't want to hear that kind of bad news. So it's a tough question, but I figured I'd start with one that wasn't too easy. There you go. Yeah, nobody wants to hear it. And I mean, the the thing that makes it difficult, and paradoxically in some ways more difficult in a, de in a democracy, is that the political cycle and the economic cycle is very short. Typically a four or five year election cycle and a five year business plan cycle. And so the politician who gets up and is honest and says, we can't go on doing this, we're gonna to have to do with less, uh, we cannot, um, continue ripping the environment to bits for the, sh the sake of uh, short-term jobs, it's very difficult for that person to get elected. You're one of the few <laughs> who's, who's been honest with the bad news. You know, everybody wants to shoot the messenger. Mm. Um, how do we, you know, get off that treadmill is an incredibly complex subject, which, you know, I, I don't have any easy answers. Um, when I wrote A Short History of Progress, I was, I, the book focused much more than the film, the book focused on, on the past. It looked, turned the telescope on where we had come from to try and figure out where we were going. And I think what, what the film does so brilliantly is sort of turn it around the other way and look ahead, more specifically. Um, but, so in the book, I was looking at the past and looking at these patterns of, of rise and fall and triumph from disaster and saying, um, there's, you know, I think the building's on fire. Um, but I'm not the fireman. 
and I didn't build a building, and I'm not quite sure how to save it. Uh, and uh, I, mean, I think in a general level, we all know, uh, as Vachla Smil said, so well, you know, we have to make do with less. We, we know that. We have to, uh, there is a role for genuine progress in technology and greater efficiencies and new forms of energy and so forth. Um, but even if we discovered the ideal form of energy tomorrow that didn't pollute, let's say we, we find that we can make fusion work on Earth tomorrow, um, that's not necessarily a good thing because then we would just keep expanding, developing, uh, multiplying, etc. cetera, um, and we would still outrun the Earth's resources, I think. Um, so it, it's more than just looking at the limitations of energy. It, it, we actually have to, to do what um, the UN, the, uh, the Millennium um, Assessment, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was called now, Living Beyond Our Means. It came out in 2004. Um, it was the, the work of 1,400 scientists from 95 countries, and, and, it, and, and it included uh, you know, the United States government, the, the World Bank, the UN, and it was a survey to see how much, um, how much nature can produce that we can use without degrading nature. And the findings were very chilling, because essentially the findings were dated around the year 2000. And as of that point, they found that you know, we had de degraded an enormous proportion of um, the uh, natural systems in the world, and that um, you know, this just can't go on. The message was, was put out there in a very scientific way, but also in a, in a digestible form in this um, uh, report that you can get on the web called Living Beyond Our Means. Um, the great problem, another problem is the media. The media don't want to give us the real story. They'd much rather tell us about the miracle baby that's pulled out from under a collapsed building in an earthquake, or you know, any number of these, these, these wonderful, inspiring human interest stories, rather than telling us about the real human condition and just how serious it is. And the media really missed that whole chance to um, bring us that story, the work of, of this, it, the most extensive uh, program, as far as I know, to ever assess our situation, um, because the Pope died at the same time. And, you know, for about a month it was the Pope's ill, is the Pope going to die, and then it was the Pope has died, and then it was who's going to be the next Pope, and by the time all that was over, everybody had forgotten about this report. In fact, most people don't even know it exists. So the media, in a democracy, is supposed to inform us so we can make the right choices at election time. Uh, I think the media is falling down, and one reason they're falling down is the concentration of ownership. When you have uh, media owned by a few hands, and as mainly very rich corporate hands who have a vested interest in not giving us the bad news because they're locked into the short-term cycle and the short-term way of seeing things, then we do not have the information to throw the bastards out. So, in, in taking it to another, sorry, in taking it to the next you know, obvious question is the climate crisis is where the scientific information is becoming deafening. I mean, James Hansen's most recent study, which again got scant media attention, it got some, which is more than nothing, to say, look, I, you know, we've now done an analysis of the fact that the Moscow fires, the huge drought in, in Russia that took place at the same time that of the huge Pakistan floods, and now I'm looking, at, having looked at it in a scientific model that was not projecting based on modeling, but actually analyzing based on statistical likelihood that these number of extreme events, including the heat we're experiencing today in Sydney, uh, could possibly have been by uh, a random chance of the kinds of extreme weather events that are always going to happen uh, in any uh, you know, climate system. You're going to have extreme weather events. And then James Hansen said, look, there's no question about this now. This is a result of human activity, and it's going to get much, much worse unless we reduce greenhouse gases. And yet the coverage of uh, droughts in the United States, particularly in the United States, they seem to be they seem to regard mentioning climate change as something that will uh, be the, you know, either for Obama or Romney, something that will guarantee, guaranteed lose them the election. But in Canada, even the parties that claim to care about climate don't want to talk about it. So I, mean, I guess I'm probing the same problem. How do we, in a culture and in a society where we are essentially anesthetized and addicted 
to our consumer goods and a particular expectation of what life's supposed to be like. We don't like uncomfortable truths. We didn't, it's my parents and grandparents who grew up in the Depression. We don't know, we don't want to know that things can be hard. We want to know that everything's going to be okay, and that's why economic growth is the perfect, perfect prescription. Instead of saying we can actually be better off if we, ch if we get out of our progress traps. Very hard conversation to have. And I, I, I'm going to ask anyone who wants to ask Ron a question at this point, do line up at a mic, because this will be my last question to Ron. And I want to hear what you have to think about this and what you have to say, because I think if we can figure out how to talk about this, we can get a lot of people in Canada who are disillusioned with politics interested again. So again, given what we know about the climate crisis, and given that we know that we're not really here hugging trees and trying to save the planet, we have a foolish love, I do, and Farley disagrees with me, of course, I have a foolish, desperate love of humanity, and I really love civilization, and I don't want to let us lose it. So what do we do? <laughs> No, I, I'm with you there. I mean, when I was, uh, I can't remember if I actually said this in, in the book, but I think I did, um, that, that, you know, I want the experiment of civilization to succeed. I don't really want to go back to living in caves, you know, and, and, and there is, we've got, civilization has reached a scale now that um, if we lose um, our technological knowledge, if somehow um, systems break down and we go back to a subsistence level, uh, we can't feed anything like 7 billion people that way. So it, a collapse, even a, very, a serious um, temporary collapse, is going to mean uh, desperate times, uh, very likely spiraling into chaos from revolution, warfare, and so on. Um, so the, the, per, the, the goal here is to make things work. And uh, I believe that it, it, it is probably not too late that we have a chance. <laughs> See, we're, we're under surveillance here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we, we still have a chance to make it work, and we have to, whatever we may think about how bad the situation is, I, I think we have a duty to ourselves and our uh, descendants to act on the assumption that we can fix things. Because if we just throw up our hands and say it's too late, which is in many ways what the oil industry would like us to do in the case of uh, carbon emissions, that first of all they say it's not happening, and then suddenly they say, well, it's too late anyway. You know? um, once we do that, then we, we've lost the plot, and, and we've given up, and we will not change, and we will undoubtedly spiral down to, into disaster. So we, we definitely have to work on the assumption that we can, we can fix it. Um, but it will take um, a great shift, uh, not only in values, but in, 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 in the way we think. And one of the things we have to let go of, of course, is the idea that everything is getting bigger and better all the time, and everyone is going to get wealthier, and we can have you know, a, as many people on Earth as we want because there's no limit. We ha have to get rid of that idea. That's number one. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn to, p to our participants and just be, I know, I think I know everybody in lineup, but just say your name and where you're from and ask your question. And I'm going to try to get through everybody there, and we're, we're going to break at 9. So just that gives you a sense, those of you who are in line, not to make speeches, but to ask good questions, and I trust you on that. I'm disappointed that so far there's only men at the microphones, not saying I'm anything much about that except I love you, but anybody else that might be female is welcome at the microphones. Uh, Thomas, why don't you go first? Thank you, Thomas Toivin. I'm here in Sydney, and uh, a specific question, but I do need to uh, preface it by this statement, is that we uh, function in our particular location on hope. We're trying to build a sustainable model here in Sydney on a town lot uh, that we call an urban oasis. We've taken the step of living car free, living vegetarian, building a small footprint house, uh, doing everything we can to reduce our consumption uh, on every level. Um, the question that I have for Ronald Wright um, is not so much in the movie but in your book you talk about hope as being uh, that we're doomed by hope 
And we function on the hope that we can come up with a, a better model, a paradigm shift that less is more. And I would like you to talk a little bit more about how you see that notion today, eight years after you wrote that book. Uh, is hope still the thing that's going to doom us? Well, I, um, when I said that you know, hope is part of the problem, I think what I was referring to was the human tendency to hope for the best, to hope that we're going to be lucky and that we can sort of carry on being bad and get away with it. Uh, that's the kind of hope um, that will, will do us in. But of course, uh, in order to, uh, to embrace these kinds of changes you're talking about, um, we need some clear-eyed hope that will uh, inspire us to go through, uh, to make difficult changes and, and uh, radical changes not only in thinking but in how we live. Uh, of course, we, that is the kind of hope we do need. But politicians, with uh, some notable exceptions, <laughs> Uh, trade very often in an illusion of false hope. And that's what I was attacking there. Okay. Go over here to this microphone. Yeah, the Nord Albert. Uh, I'm from uh, Quebec. I was a candidate in Paul Missisqua. Uh, there's one person that is really, uh, besides Elizabeth, that is really giving me hope in this movie. It's uh, Marina Silva. Uh, Marina Silva got 19.6% uh, of the votes in the first uh, round in Brazil. She provoked the second tour, thanks to Marina that was the Minister of the Environment of Lula and then moved to the Green Party. Got 19.6% of the vote. 20. This lady comes from a very, very poor, poor uh, suburb. She didn't know how to write and read at 16 years old. Uh, She's an amazing lady. Uh, I, I study Portuguese. That's why I, I listen to all the video. I, I know uh, her speech. She's amazing. She can go on TV for, for, for hours, and, and she's not never boring. Anyways, I, I wanted to get to a point. Uh, there's someone that tried to def define uh, progress uh, about 30 years ago. His name is uh, Nicola Judges Corrogan. Uh, uh, Nicola Judges Corrogan wrote a book called Entropy and the Economic Process. Uh, he was challenging Sam Nelson. He was saying, this idea, this classic economy, is not going to work because of the entropy law. And he finally got to the conclusion that the only value of the economic activity is actually joy. Uh, joy. And the pleasure of life. Uh, and uh, I'd like a reaction from you on, on that. Um, of course, uh, the college school Rogan was considered a marginal uh, by traditional economists. But uh, I just want to mention that I work for a teacher that actually summarized this idea of joy but with a, a, a book called La Décroissance en Français that was translated in English by degrowth, negative growth, degrowth, the idea. They have a newspaper in France that uh, actually prints about uh, more than 2,000 co copies uh, every month. So there's a movement in Europe to uh, consider degrowth uh, as a source of joy. And uh, so I'd like a reaction on that. Thank you. Merci um, beaucoup. Well, I think, I think probably what you're getting at here is the, that for uh, a long time now, particularly in, in Western civilization, we have, um, people have derived uh, a feeling of prestige and a feeling of control uh, over their lives through the acquisition of material power and material gadgets and so forth. And that, um, you know, there are other ways to feel good about yourself. And obviously joy is a big one. Um, and also there's the, I think it's an old ancient Greek idea, the idea of the respect of your fellows, you know, that, that um, the man who is esteemed or the woman who is esteemed is not necessarily um, the richest, the most powerful man, but is the um, the best rounded, the wisest, and so on. Um, so, yeah, we do need, obviously, to replace the sort of instant fix. That, uh, and let's remember, we're all being bombarded incessantly by the propaganda of advertising. And I mean, I remember growing up in the Cold War when, you know, the people in, in the West said, of course, all those poor people in the Soviet bloc they are bombarded by propaganda all the time, telling them how wonderful their, their system is when, you know, it's not working for them. And 
We're in exactly that situation now, where we are bombarded with propaganda to fulfill our lives by buying the latest gadget from Apple. Um, and that is nothing other than propaganda. And if I were king of the world tomorrow, I think advertising would be one of my first targets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to the next microphone question, but I just, there's, there's always the construct for Greens that we also do want economic health and prosperity, but we want it at a level that it actually, that where the economy supports human society, rather than human society sort of being seen as the raw material to be fed into a vast meat grinder to churn something out the other end for somebody else's benefit. So it's, I'm cognizant that we're out live streaming across and all, and, and we agree with, we, we understand the context here in this room, but for Greens around and across Canada, we actually have good economic plans. And that's what people don't necessarily believe about us. You don't have to, I mean, it's really rather good news. You don't have to commit global suicide to make, to make a profit in the short term. I mean, that's, that's good news. You can make some <laughs> economic success stories at the same time as ensuring that there's going to be another generation. But anyway, I'm, I'm being bad because I'm intruding on the time. And, and, your well, next I, microphone question. I, I just it, your name again and where you're from? Yeah, it's uh, Graham Johnson from Outremont, Montreal. And uh, just to pick up on, on what has been said, un until we can change the human heart, uh, we, you know, it's a spiritual uh, battle essentially, is, is I think what we're, we're all about these days. And maybe it's the new fight that it was the Cold War, before that it was World War II. This is maybe what our generations will be fighting. But in the meantime, we have a system. And the first question was, how can we work with the system that we have? How can we change the system that we have when it's so all-powerful? And one of the ideas is if we can fully understand that system and use it against itself to try and keep things ticking over on the planet until we can change the human heart, which will be a long time coming. Um, but uh, one example, and then I was, I was going to uh, ask you if in your research and thinking you've, you'd thought of other ways to use the system uh, so that we can use it to save ourselves. Um, Nature Conservancy, for example, which is a controversial uh, charity to some people, but which uses the fact of the rule of law in property ownership and says, we're going to buy um, property and we're going to keep it virgin um, and we're going to use the force of law and capitalism uh, and property rights to enforce our rights to not do anything with that. That's just an example of using the system against itself until we can come up with something better. In your thinking, what are the other examples or some examples maybe that you've come up uh, where we could do some things like that before we can change the whole system? Opportunities to sort of change it from within. Yeah. Um, well, I think one of one of the great opportunities, and which I think still is still there, is the uh, financial crisis that began in '08, and um, which was a big factor in in, in bringing in um, President Obama. And um, without sort of wanting to blame Obama for everything that he either didn't do or couldn't do, I, I think there was a great opportunity in that moment in 08, when all of these bankers who'd been saying, we don't need governments, we don't want regulation, go away, let us make money for everybody and we'll all get rich. When all of those bankers suddenly fell on their faces with enormous debts, um, there was a golden moment to, to re-regulate, to bring the financial sector as, back as, as, a, as a pillar of society, as, a, as one of and the economic sector as one of many pillars that make civilization. Uh, and to, in other words, to, to bring it back into line. And, and one of the things that could have been done at the time, because the European leaders were supporting it, including uh, people sort of center-right, like Sarkozy, were, um, was the Tobin tax, or the Robin Hood tax, where you impose a small tax on these immense sums of money that slosh around the planet every day. And uh, that, that idea was first proposed by a gentleman named Tobin in the late 70s. Um, and it has the merit of raising money internationally from people who have so much they don't even really know how much they have. So it taxes the super rich, and it doesn't do it through national governments. It does it on a world level. 
It would have to be agreed internationally, and it would raise large sums of money painlessly, which we could use to, to address very pressing social and environmental problems, uh, relieve poverty, give basic health care uh, uh, to the poor. At the end of the last century, you know, it was only a dozen years ago, the UN calculated that to provide, you know, there are seven billion people in the world and approximately two billion live in dire poverty on less than about $1.50 a day. And the, the UN calculated at the time that the cost of lifting those two billion up to the point where they had basic health care, birth control, of course, would have to be part of that, um, safe sewage disposal, safe water to drink, basic education, and those, those very basic things. Um, that limited social safety net would have cost approximately um, 40, I think it was 40 billion um, a year, which at the time everybody said, well, that's a lot of money. But it's actually less than half what was spent every year on the Iraq war by the United States alone. So you know, things can be done. The problem really is not so much a technological problem as a political problem. It's a political, it's a matter of what our priorities are. So, uh, and as Naomi Klein pointed out um, in her, um, most, her, her latest book, um, what was it, can you remember the title? Was it Shock Doctrine? The Shock Doctrine, yes. The, the, the extreme right used crises mm -hmm. in other societies to impose this draconian Reaganomics um, on people, governments and peoples who didn't want to do it, but who had no choice when they were in a state of crisis. And um, I think now that capitalism is in crisis, we who think that the values of capitalism need to be recalibrated have an opportunity to say, wait a minute, you guys, you're not delivering the goods. I mean, essentially, the, the people at the top are, are, are rapidly getting into the position of those ancient Maya kings who were no longer delivering the rainfall and who had cut down all the jungle uh, to build their enormous temples and palaces. Uh, they were morally bankrupt, and that's when we can affect change, if we can get the message out to, to enough people. Thank you. Uh, to this microphone, Chai. Thank you. I'm Chai Kalewar uh, from Toronto, planet Earth. <laughs> and I was recently at Rio Plus 20. And I missed few things there. I saw your movie and I missed those few things again here. And I thought I'd like to point them out here. Firstly, there is a part of the world who has a history of discovering lands without meeting people. And they have had the benefits of global resources for some time. And it seems they still want it. And they'll find any excuse to go to even war for it. And it's happening now. I'm sure what I'm talking about. However, at Rio Plus 20, there were two issues, as I said. Definitely, I missed badly. One was, all the BRIC countries, as you know, are going nuclear. There was no talk of nuclear there. Neither was it in your uh, bill. And perhaps you are aware that right now in our lungs we have parts of Fukushima. We don't have to wait for climate change. The nuclear technology or the technology that we cannot control is within our body now. That's one issue that didn't get dealt with there and I suggest you make another film for that. <laughs> well, I didn't make the film. I, I didn't make the film. I, I mean, I, I, there, there, there are several things that I, if I had been making the film, I probably would have done differently. I mean, I, I would like to have seen a picture of the tar sands, uh, and I would like to have seen a, a picture of a Canadian clear cut, not only a Brazilian one, but I mean, those, those are minor criticisms. But of course, everybody would ha has different priorities and so forth. So I didn't make sure. My lungs are my first priorities. I don't know what your priorities are, lungs are my first priority. But anyway, the other issue which perhaps didn't get dealt with which you in your answers just now, there are two billion people in dire poverty. But if the rest of the world would have followed China's policy, one child policies for the last 30 or 40 years, we would have those two billion people. We will not be at seven billion, but we will be at five billion. It 
would have been much easier to feed and to look after 5 billion than 7 billion who are growing fast and still we are quibbling about some implementation of one child policy in China and we are not even thinking about it the rest of it. And that population control is another issue that was missed at Rio plus 20 but and I suggest it is missed in this film. Thanks, Chair. I'm just going to point out to people that I promised we'd end by nine. We may go a little over. We have six speakers at the mic, so I'd really appreciate people kept their questions short. And I don't know if you'd like to respond to, uh, you did speak to population in the parts of the interview in, in the film, but if you, if you want to make any comment on, on that last point. Um, well, yeah, I, the population thing is, um, as, as, as I and others in the film said, there are two things. One is just the sheer number of human beings, and the other is the, the footprint of, of the individual human being in different societies, which varies enormously. So one thing we can begin to do in, immediately is, is bring down the gap between rich and poor and level out that footprint. Um, but uh, in terms of cutting down the overall numbers, um, the rate of increase is slowing. Um, you know, India tried a, a fairly draconian method that didn't work in, in I think it was during Indira Gandhi's um, prime ministership, and uh, China, of course, the famous one-child policy. But in actual fact, it's been shown that in almost every society that, that achieves a basic level of, uh, of security and decency, so that people do not feel they have to have huge families in order that, that you know, a few kids will survive to look after them when they get old. Uh, the population, uh, the rate of increase starts to drop rapidly uh, and the European countries are already below replacement level and I think without immigration, Canada would actually be a completely level. Um, the United States is one of the few exceptions that has, has a natural increase excluding immigration, which is about the same as the world average, which is just a little over 1%. A little over 1% doesn't sound bad. I mean, if you go back 30, 40 years, the rate was much higher than that. But 1% is still enough to double every 70 years. And, and you know, clearly, you know, we're now at 7. We can't possibly have 14 billion 70 years from now. So uh, I think that those kinds of policies I was talking about that the UN advocated to lift the, the, the poorest people out of poverty would have a very beneficial effect. Um, but then we might have to go to something else, some sort of something that would be seen as politically equitable, something perhaps a lottery system, incentives, and so forth, to, to bring the numbers down. But something we can do right away is, is to curb sort of obscene levels of consumption by a small segment of the world's population that is beggaring the entire planet, not only for the poor who are here today, but for, the, for all future generations. Yeah. Brian. Hi, uh, my name is Brian Smallshaw. I'm from uh, Salt Spring Island here in uh, the Saanich Gulf Islands writing. Um, uh, the film made the point that the uh, economic system is at the root of many of our problems. And my question for you, it's partially, partially been answered, but do you believe that the economic system itself is reformable? Or are we just going to hit the wall and is there going to be collapse? And if it is reformable, is it through steps like the Tobin tax, for instance, maybe, or is that really enough? Or is it going to take a more sweeping uh, change to our economic system to really solve the problem? Um, yeah, well, I, I was using a Tobin tax as, as one example of a good idea that very nearly got traction during the time of crisis when the bankers were discredited. And it's right. such a shame that chance wasn't taken. But it's not too late, and people are still talking about it. Um, uh, is, the, is the economic system reform, reformable? I think the answer to that is yes, it is. I, 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 we don't have to go very far back. I mean, it's still within living memory when all of the Western democracies worked on a, a Keynesian-based system, you know, named after the famous uh, economist John Maynard Keynes, um, which attempted to regulate capitalism, that you, you, to, to level out this boom-bust cycle. And in order to, to do that, you have to tax during the boom times, and then the governments spend during the bus times to keep people employed. And um, after two horrible world wars, especially the Second World War, which you know, grew up in a, uh, arose to a large degree out, out of, out of the, the worldwide depression, um, millions of people on the streets, the growth of extremists, violent extremist parties, um, and the First World War. I mean, it, after the Second World War, there was a worldwide consensus that if we didn't want to see more 
Bolsheviks, Nazis, and anarchists in the streets committing acts of violence and destabilizing society, that society had to be seen as, as fair and just and a society in which everybody was treated fairly and had a stake. And that was the intent, building on Keynes's ideas to put into place the welfare states that all of the, the, the wealthy countries built. Some of them began before the Second World War, but it really went through afterwards. And that included things like free universal health care. It included things like free education right up to the secondary level. I mean, when I went to university, I, I, nobody in Britain had to pay tuition. Uh, it was Tony Blair who brought tuition back for uh, undergraduates, <laughs> of all people. Not even Thatcher dared touch that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a within li living memory. We had a system where the ratio between what a shop floor worker and a CEO earned in a major US corporation was a ratio of 39 to 1. That's only 30 years ago. Now it's well over 1,000 to 1. Mm -hmm. So things have gone off the rails spectacularly, but quite recently. And I think that, and there are people like Joseph Stiglitz, who, who calls himself a neo Keynesian. And I mean, Keynesianism is not a, a fixed set of ideas, it's, a, it's, it's, it's just a philosophy that the economy has to serve society rather than the other way around. And the way to do that is to eliminate extremes of wealth and poverty. And now we have to do it not only, of course, within nations, but also between them. And that's an idea with, which goes right back to Plato, who proposed that in the ideal republic, the, the, the lowest uh, earner and the top earner, that the ratio should only be five to one. Hmm. Now that seems pretty extreme, but I think we could probably work towards the ratio of 10 to 1. So that say, every Canadian's income is not less than 50,000 and not more than 500,000 in today's money. You know, something like that is celebrated. Going to that microphone and that uh, unknown high school teacher from Claremont High School known as Mark Newfeld. My name is Mark Newfield. I'm a high school teacher. <laughs> I teach at Claremont High School. We have an Institute for Global Solutions. Apparently you're coming to see us on September 27th. Thank you for that. Now it's public record. Wait, it's not September 22nd, is it? Yeah, but, uh, 27th, good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm eternally hopeful as a result of Ms. May and her involvement of young people and I think I'd be interested to hear you talk about how young people can maybe shift what the rest of us haven't yet figured out which is why teaching senior secondary students is such an absolutely wonderful job because in three years all of my kids will vote and I think if we really took some time and put some emphasis on that group of kids who would then vote in the next federal election, we could change Canada. And I wonder what your thoughts are involving young people in maybe helping them think differently than we have thought, because I think there's a revolution there. Well, well uh, thank you for, for bringing that up. And I, um, I have been very heartened since, you know, writing the book and, and since the film was made, uh, just how many young people get excited by these ideas. First of all, they see the problem very quickly, uh, and secondly, they have the energy and they also lack that sort of inertia that builds up during the course of a lifetime, which <laughs> enables them to, to, to see ways of doing it. Um, I, so, yes, absolutely. That's, the place we have to, to start and pour an enormous amount of energy into. Uh, and, and young people, I think, have an innate sense of fairness. Um, working against that, of course, is the bombardment of advertising, the, uh, the, 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 um, the pernicious effects of, of the web. Uh, not all of them are pernicious, but some are, and so forth. Um, and I always also, there's always the difficulty of getting people to, to keep the faith as they get older, because my generation was going to change the world with, with you know, rock music, um, the right drugs, and getting out and, and protesting. And, and, you know, I took part in, in, in demonstrations against the Vietnam War, you know, which turned into pitched battles. And we thought, 
we really thought we were going to change the world and then somehow it got away from us. So that, that is a battle that has to continue. That is, that is, a, that is a, 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 a uh, we, we have to, to, to do what you're saying and, and what Elizabeth has been saying, um, but the flame has to be tended throughout people's lives. Uh, I think one reason the flame wasn't tended was perhaps the boom times of the 70s and, and, and then the, the, and the 80s and the, the, um, the tearing up of the lessons of the Second World War when you know, suddenly everybody in the West had a sort of an attack of, of, of historical and cultural amnesia and said there's no need to regulate capitalism. We just let it rip and everyone will get so rich it'll all trickle down and it won't matter. And just as old Reagan was saying there on, in the film. Um, and we tore up those lessons. So a big component of this is uh, bringing the lessons of history back and putting those in front of young people, uh, as well as uh, you know, stimulating the, their innate desire for fairness and for a better society. And I think a lot of young people are also aware, and this is why so many of them are out, have been out in the Occupy movement and so on, they're aware that the idea that times are getting better and better and everyone's going to get richer and own a bigger car and a bigger house, that that's over. And that's not going to happen for them. And that they are actually going to be coming of age and, and, and uh, raising their own families, probably in a, in a time of either no growth or shrinkage. We only have to hope that that shrinkage is controlled and that the shrinkage is compensated by the kind of thing Elizabeth was talking about, which is new industries, new technologies that are sustainable, and a society that is built on the basis uh, materially of uh, quality, quality rather than quantity. We have three people left at the mics, and I'm going to ask your indulgence that we stay and, and hear the three questions, but would you be, oh, is that a fourth person who was sitting while waiting at the mic? Okay, I'm going to ask, and I know this sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work as well. Does it work for you if I ask for all four comments and then we try to do one comment okay, to, sure. to sum up? So everybody at the mic will get to ask their question, tell us who you are, where you're from, and uh, Ron will brilliantly synthesize and give one answer. <laughs> You have to help. Yeah, I'll help. Okay. <laughs> yes, my name is David Weston. I'm from Milano and uh, moved in the Green Party since 1983. I'm very moved by the uh, dynamic that you see here uh, tonight and today, and from a pers person who's lived most of his life involved in issues. I feel encouraged. There are two areas that I would like to comment on and ask for feedback. There are spiritual questions, questions of ethics, and questions of supply. The two figures are 321%, and the other figure is 4%. We have been searching for years for ways of producing energy, electricity particularly, and amongst those has been, oh shut up, <laughs> sorry, excuse me, pardon me, um, uh, has been, uh, oh, I've lost my train of thought, figures, figures. Three, 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 right, 321 uh, uh, percentage, that is the figure that is recognized in Bavaria, uh, whereby we have produced since 1997 until the present electricity enough to power the whole of the county, the whole of the state, and now parts of other parts of the state, and the, the mechanism is solar power, solar energy. We hear a lot about solar energy, but it has a particular role in as much as it is not. Uh, it is recyclable, renewable, and not, not, not inhibiting of the economy. The second figure is the 4%, and it is a figure that's been dealt with throughout the ages in historical and uh, spiritual books of various kinds, 4% is the amount that is put forward as the limit that should be charged on interest. And usually, 
and there is a, a, a death knell for any freedom. And then usually it can be used when and when we see some of the things that have been going on in the banking system. So I just like to comment on those things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm going to go to, uh, before we could, we went to that whole row there before my, okay, so that the young woman in line behind David. Hi. Hi, Elizabeth. I'm Ron. And Cynthia Montgomery and Myron Jefferson. Hi. Uh, Cynthia helped me a lot during my campaign. She's a wonderful person from Duncan. Organized a green meeting over there. She plays guitar and she sings really good. <laughs> um, oh, I had a lot of questions and a lot of comments, but uh, it's about the import and export and the free trade agreement. And uh, I was fortunate to meet Alan Warnke, a teacher at the VIU, a very smart man and teaching global study, I understood about the import and export and the negative side of the uh, import and export. And, um, you know, if I was campaign again and people were to ask me, how are we, we going to grow the economy if we um, don't export or import, let's say stuff from China or which I don't want, um, also, um, talk about the pipeline, and uh, I joined the um, uh, Dogwood Initiative about the coal being exported to countries where they have factories and manufacturers, and of course we all, oh, I can't say all, um, people do shop at Walmart, so, um, and um, is that what we're exporting, and if it was exporting, you know, you know, we only export that kind of stuff where the old growth forests or coal. Um, to the Green Party, to Elizabeth, what's the plan of if we do export? Is, is it abolishing the import and export completely? Or is it to keep the import and export but with a, a strict um, agreement on, I don't know, something that we can, it's uh, environmentally friendly um, export? and also important, we really need anything, because it seems that money, the whole system is formed around the export and import. Okay. That's it. Thank you. And then um, behind you then, we'll do that and then we'll go over this mic. Thank you very much. My name is Diane Rhodes and I'm from Saskatchewan, Canada. And I spent the last 12 years in the United States working on climate change in South Florida, a very Republican district. Um, I see our major problem as being time, and uh, we're running out of time to solve this problem. It's very, very difficult. Um, our other big problem, of course, is awareness and getting people aware of, of the gravity of the situation. And you touched just a moment ago on something that I think we have to go to now. Um, we have to be able to talk to our governments and let our governments know that we're not happy with what's going on. And when we look at um, the Occupy movement, when we look at um, what Bill McKibben is doing in 350.org and civil disobedience, and uh, something that I was a little bit involved with in Saskatoon just recently, of course, were the rallies with leadnow.ca around Bill C-38. And I wonder, Elizabeth and both of you, if, if you see this as another direction that we really should be moving at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Diana. And last, last point, and then we'll try to wrap them all up. Great. Yeah, hi, uh, Mike Feinstein. I'm a former Green Party mayor and city council member in Santa Monica, California. I'm exploring running for governor of California in 2014. And, and, and as, as I was watching the film, I was thinking about the challenges and opportunities of trying to communicate a paradigm shift in the electoral arena. In addition to what we can learn from what Elizabeth did in a single riding, any advice on how to communicate these kind of ideas in, an, in a nation state like California, running for governor. Thank you. Thanks. Well, 
<laughs> Thanks, Mike. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do anything we can to help you in California. You're not so far away for those of us on the West Coast. Um, Ron, we had the first question from David from Nanaimo in looking at the fact this is both a spiritual question and an ethical question. We have this tremendous capacity in renewables, and at the same time, so he posited the 321% uh, as what's possible in terms of energy from solar and the 4% of limiting interest rates. Uh, we had the question about what do we do about trade, and that seemed to be more directed to me, so I'll take a shot at that about imports and exports, but if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, Diane from Saskatchewan asking this is sort of the same question I asked over, except but specifically with reference to Occupy Movement, 350.org. What do we do as citizen grassroots movements to raise awareness? And because I couldn't agree with you more, Diane, we're running out of time. And then Mike's question, how do we communicate all that? So let me get out of the way quickly some of the, the Green Party position on trade. We have never supported the globalization of trade model that says that nation states and democratic decision making uh, in democracies should be secondary to corporate profits. So this is the essence of Chapter 11 of NAFTA, is that corporations should have the right to sue municipal, provincial, or uh, national governments if their expectation of profits at a corporate level with, in the context of NAFTA, for Canada, we can be sued by corporations from the United States or Mexico. Not surprisingly, we've been sued a lot by corporations from the United States. Uh, and that, that is, as Stephen Schreibman, who's one of my friends, who's a uh, the Council for Ca Council of Canadians, the lawyer for Council of Canadians, put it best, like it's fundamentally corrosive of democracy to say that a foreign corporation has the right to sue if their expectation of profits is reduced. Now that's not the same as saying we're against trade. Uh, one of my favorite senators of all time, well he wasn't my favorite minister of agriculture, so I have to say he was my favorite senator of all time, was Eugene Whalen, who used to say, what do you think Marco Polo was, a tourist? <laughs> We've had trade a long time. We're not going to stop trade. But the, the context of trade should be trade in goods in fair terms, and not to say that a trade agenda masquerading as a, a trade agenda has the right to limit labor rights, environmental protections, uh, and now as we're looking at in terms of either the, uh, the, uh, uh, the CETA agreement, the uh, economic trade agreement with Europe, or we're announcing a statement uh, tomorrow, I guess, with the Green Party of New Zealand, Green Party of Australia, and Green Party of US signing on as well on the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that Stephen Harper is so keen on. Those agreements aren't really about trade. They extend into saying that corporate rights are going to exceed the rights of democratic governments, that municipalities won't have the right to have local procurement policies, that we won't have the right to say that when the U.S. is massively subsidizing its agricultural sector, we can't hang on to supply management. So there's, there's elements of trade that we absolutely must have and that make sense. But it doesn't make sense to say that trade in food products for corporate profits is more important than local food security. And that's the balance that we need to achieve. So, and I'll leave the rest of the questions to you. <laughs> well, I, I could completely endorse everything you said. I mean, the, 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 the problem is not so much international trade agreements as the fact that they, they have to balance um, economic uh, benefits with social and environmental benefits. And uh, what, what the things like NAFTA and, and, and most of the free trade agreements that um, North America in particular is interested in try to uh, privilege economic interests over those of, of labor, those of the environment, and also, of course, national governments. I mean, what we've seen in my lifetime is an incredible erosion of the power of governments. And it's a seizure, little by little, by unelected, very often not even, uh, unelected corporations that very often are multinational, not even based in the country that, whose, whose institutions they are undermining and trying to supersede. Um, yes, it's an obscenity that a foreign corporation can, can sue us because we want to uh, impose certain environmental and labor standards or mm. uh, trade standards, whatever. Um, that has to stop. I, I totally agree. Um, the only sort of uh, I sometimes talk about the European Union. Now, I know the European Union is kind of not, perhaps not the best model just at the moment, but don't count it out. It's one of the few, it's one of the few of these big trade areas that 
also has uh, a level playing field for labor laws and environmental laws. And in that way, it is better balanced than any of the others that I know. Yeah. Um, and it perhaps shows a better model for it than the ki kind of um, corporate grab that not the NAFTA and uh, those kinds of agreements uh, represent. Um, uh, as for trade, again, this, this cuts into the, the other question about, um, you know, if you have, if you don't have world standards for social conditions and environmental protection, what you get is, is what we've seen happening uh, very much in Asia recently, that the rich nations export their carbon emissions by just buying the cheap stuff that's made somewhere where nobody's keeping track of those things and nobody's doing anything about it. Or similarly, they actually have, have destroyed their own industries and their own employment by uh, buying stuff that's made by sweatshop labor. Uh, that, again, has to change. So what we need to see, really, is a is, is level playing field worldwide for trade, the environment, and labor. And guess what? That's the Green Party policy. Wow. What? <laughs> we have... <laughs> so, I'm, I'm going to just, and in terms of where it is in Green Party policy, it's the notion that we need a, uh, a global regulation. To the, now, of course, people watching, the, we, we know that people think there's black helicopters of the UN circling over all this and that global governance. And what we need is if we can have under the GATT and the WTO rules that work, that regulate protection of intellectual property rights, we can have rules that work that advance the reduction of greenhouse gases. The mechanisms are all in place. The problem is that they only work towards the agenda that hastens civilization's end instead of harnessing those tools that clearly work. Because we know that if you want, if you want to sneak across a, a pirated DVD, border cops have the right to open the trunk of your car, search and seize, and fine you. And not only that, for a bunch of people who claim that it's about liberating the marketplace and getting rid of big government, the effect of the TRIPS Agreement for Protection of Intellectual Property Rights is to force governments to pass laws that look just like U.S. patent law. So that's, uh, there's, it's, it's all a nonsense that this isn't about government intervention. It's about government intervention in the aid of expanding globalized corporate profits and in the, with the goal of reducing the capacities of dem democratically elected governments to protect the citizenry and the natural resources within each of those sovereign nation states. So it's, it's a very interesting argument that we could, in fact, put in place a level playing field that's based on a principle that the OECD accepted years ago, that corporations should be required to take on reasonable expectations of a social contract and responsibilities before they get a whole bunch of new rights. So rather than give my speech now, because I haven't written it yet, and I'm not sure what I'm going to say, I think, I think I need to let you know that after I thank Ron, I have a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Anne-Marie, can you bring up this lovely gift we have for Ron? This is, our speakers are receiving a beautiful piece of art by Rick Silas. Appropriately enough, given the climate crisis, these are icebergs. They are iceberg glass, and it's our gift and our thank you. And I want to ask you all to join me in thanking Ronald Wright for identifying our progress track. Thank you for the question.